And the birds? Nope, all dead. Isn't that a shame? Though, to be frank, I never really cared much for chickens. But that's a long story I will not get into. Uh-huh. Cheerily nodded as the two ducked into a rear doorway of a two-story cinder block building on the edge of Ponyville. The sound of theirs and the officers' hooves echoed across brightly lit corridors as they took a left, a right, and descended a series of steps into a dimly lit basement. You certainly miss a lot of things from where you're from. <laughs> I'm just rambling off a list of random crud that I see. Do forgive me. Scootaloo chuckled against her shadows on the walls. It's just been so long since I've talked to another pony. What, with all you being dead and stuff? I'm amazed that I didn't take to talking to myself after so many years of being alone. I used to always think that's what bums did. But wait, did Ponyville have bums? I must be getting my memories mixed up with that one summer I spent at a foster home in Manhattan. Boy, did I laugh when I found that place was flooded with seawater and harpy turds after the cataclysm. Oh, wow, that, that does sound funny. Cheerily droned, her smile a plastic one as she finally stopped in her tracks, glancing over Scootaloo's shoulders and towards the officers. Pfft, why would that be funny? Scootaloo smirked, blinked, then glanced stupidly around the basement. There were several barred cells lining the corridor. Wait, where in the hay are we? Suddenly, both stallions gave her a vicious shove. She stumbled, gasping, into one of the jail cells collapsing onto the floor as the metal barred door was slammed shut behind her. She sputtered, gasped, and clambered up to her hooves. No! No! She ran up and rammed the door with her full weight. The bars clanged and rattled, filling the basement with a thunderous echo. Even the officers jumped back at her unnatural strength, but breathed easier as the doors held. Don't do this! Scootaloo shouted. I'm so close to contacting the princess! If you just allow me to speak with her... She blinked and her eyes narrowed on the quivering face of Cheerily. You lied to me, didn't you? Th thank you, officers. The ruby-haired school teacher finally broke down, collapsing into the forelimbs of one of the uniformed stallions as he gently patted her shoulder. I, I, I didn't know what else to do. She, she was scaring the children. I, I, I was afraid she was going to do worse. You did the right thing, Miss Cheerily, the officer said, settling her trembling form. Bluestone. He motioned towards the other officer. Go fe and fetch the nurse Redheart. See if she can use her fancy schmancy degree in psychiatry to sort this poor soul out. Roger. On it. The other trotted away. Y you you think I'm crazy? Scootaloo murmured. She frowned, then snarled, banging against the bars with copper hooves. Well, maybe there's a reason to be crazy. Did you ever think of that? What if you were the last living pony stuck in a world full of endless destruction and blood? You would go crazy too, but dang it, I'm trying to do something good here. We could save Equestria. We could figure out why all this death and destruction happened. If you would just let me talk to the princess. You'll talk to someone, all right. The officer nodded towards her, his face emotionless and cool. Now calm down or Nurse Redheart's gonna have to replace these bars with something more padded. He moved cheerily away from the raving Pegasus. You, have a seat, darling. I'll get you something to drink. I've already sent Officer Haybreez to watch over your class. Everything's going to be fine. Your kids are okay. How, how could anyone just, just walk up to a classroom full of foals and disturb the peace like that? Cheerily shuddered and sniffled as the two walked towards a couch just around the corner from Scootaloo's vision. In all my years of teaching, nothing like that has ever happened. What, what could that poor soul have gone through to be so, so lost? I don't pretend to understand the mind of a pony, Miss Cheerily. My only job is to keep the peace. The word peace rang through Scootaloo's ears, laced with the distant gasps of Cheerily's sobbing voice. The breasts mutated into an invisible schoolroom full of frightened, quivering foals, their eyes brimming with tears, their eyes wide and horrified, their eyes staring at her. Why is everyone so easily scared? She slumped down to her haunches and plowed her hooves through her flustered black mane. They have to know. They have to know what's going to happen. She stammered and quivered, rocking back and forth in the center of the dimly lit jail cell. We're all gonna die. We're all gonna die. I just want to tell them all. I just want... She clenched her eyes shut as the images of the foal's frightened faces flashed once more across her mind in a spinning kaleidoscope. 
Mm, no, no, no. You do not know the horror. Not like I do. Stop crying. Stop it. Stop it. Stop! Suddenly, the cell lit up in a green aura. Scootaloo gasped. For a moment, she thought that one of the police ponies had trotted back with a lantern of some sort in his grasp, but cheerily, an officer's silver trot had been seated well beyond sight. Once more, the immense emerald glow flickered, burning from the bearing caught to the floorboards to the cinder block foundation of the place. Scootaloo stood up, shivering, and watched as a sea of green flames curtained across the room, billowed around her legs and wafted over her. There was a sudden rising sensation, like riding the harmony up through a cloud bed, and Scootaloo's copper body burned to brown, her mane melted down into a tiny violet stubble, and her eyes blinked from amber to scarlet. She was standing numbly in the burnt alchemic circles drawn onto the stone floors of a cavernous lab, under the shadow of a calmly gazing, unamused spike. I... the last pony blinked. I I'm back? Already? She gazed up at the purple dragon, her face pale. But, but I thought I was supposed to be in the past for no less than five days. He stared at her, his green-crested chin propped on a hand of serrated claws. I distinctly remember saying that I had stored enough green flame to send you back for a week. However, I did not state that I was indeed going to give you that much. But, but, but why, Spike? Scootaloo stammered. Her natural voice was once again a frail thing aged by time and suffering. I thought you were sending me back to get information. There was a knowing glint to Spike's emerald eyes as the elder dragon murmured. You said it yourself, Scootaloo. You don't do subtle. He planted both hands down and bent over to stare deep into her soul. You didn't follow an ounce of my advice, now did you? She wilted from his gaze, her eyes wavering like so many images of frightened foals still burned into her vision. Guiltily, she hung her snout towards the dull circles and muttered, How did you know? Because I know you, Scootaloo. The noble dragon paced around her and came to a stop in the center of the lab. He reached over and rested a gentle hand on her shaved mane. And though you've learned countless things in your years, and read innumerable books, survived hundreds of horrors, outrun packs of bloodthirsty monstrosities. You are still, underneath all of that, the same dashing, bold, courageous, albeit impulsive little foal that nearly ran over fellow pony villains in the road with her scooter. His lips curved slightly. Underneath all of your hardened exterior, you are still that spunky little filly who once beat up a pair of colts for making fun of me, even though you didn't know they were just joking around one rainy afternoon in April. And that little dragon, honored by the way you try to defend me, couldn't help but wish that she had thought a little more with her senses, at least as much as she did with her heart. She gnashed her teeth. She gazed up at him through moist eyes. I told them, Spike. Told who, Scootaloo? Miss Cheerily, those two police officers, the, the foals, she shuddered painfully. Th they all heard me talking about the end of the world. They thought I was rambling. A wince. And, and I was. Dang it, I was. But, but... <sighs> she shivered and buckled. Don't hold back, child. Do you realize really what you're asking me to do, Spike? She shouted up at him, a tear or two trickling down her cheeks. You want me to keep this awful truth built up like a raging boiler inside of me, and yet I'm somehow supposed to get these ponies to help me figure out why the world dies? I have to tell someone, Spike. How else am I going to learn anything? And surely you can share the truth, but you have to do it tactfully, Spike said, stroking her mane and leaning down so his large snout was even with hers. Subtlety, Scootaloo. I cannot emphasize it enough. These ponies have not been through all the fit trials and turmoils and struggles that you have. If you go galloping through the streets, screaming the world is going to end, what else can you expect from them but disbelief or utter shock? I was standing in the warmth of the sun, Scootaloo hiccuped, wiping her tears away with a trembling hoof. And there was grass, and birds, and children. Oh, goddess, the children. I scared them, Spike. I shouted at them. She clenched her eyes shut and trembled. 
I don't know why. It it was it was like you were angry at them. Her eyes flashed open. She gazed sickly up at her old friend. How horrible is that? she breathed. What did they ever do for me to envy them so much? They died, Scootaloo. All of them died, as you and I will some day die, he said. Whatever the disaster, whatever the cataclysm, it is still our greatest commonality. There will always be time for pity and envy, as they are often two halves of the same misguided coin. But that doesn't mean you should announce their doom while they're standing right in front of you. Epitaphs are meant to be engraved on pony stones, not their faces. She paced over limply towards a lone lab table and slumped down against it. She nuzzled her face tiredly into a pair of folded hoops. What use is any of that now? She gazed up pathetically at the burnt diagram of the past and future on the cave wall, at the jaded lines plastered to an encircled X1. I blew it, Spike. The first trip back in time, and I've blown my cover. I've made a mess of everything. I wouldn't be so certain of that, he said in a slight smile, shuffling across the room. Yes, a mess you indeed made, but you've hardly ruined things. Oh, really? She tilted her head up at him, frowning. So terrorizing a classroom full of young children doesn't qualify as ruining things? You spent way too many centuries inside a mountain spike. Like a good lab assistant, I've done my homework. The Elder Dragon remarked as he thumbed his clawed fingers through a shelf of parchments. Finally, he pulled out a rolled-up scroll that resembled a flake of scrap paper in his monstrous palm. Marching back on scaled legs, he knelt down and placed the document before her. While all things living have died in the hovels of Ponyville, the legacy they left behind remains remarkably intact, including the most inane bits of data that one with enough free time can scrounge up from the ruins of Oh, say, the Ponyville and Police Department of Records. She raised an eyebrow at him. Curiously, she slid the scroll towards herself, unsealed it, and stretched the quarter-century-old document open. Her scarlet eyes danced down the rows of neatly scribbled words, and her optics brightened at the end of the pursual. Her jaw dropped as she murmured, The report talks about a deranged Pegasus that was escorted to jail cell for immediate psychiatric evaluation following an incident at Miss Cheerley's schoolhouse. But as soon as the officer sent for the village nurse, the suspect disappeared. She blinked into the stone extremities of the cavernous lair. Spike, that deranged suspect was me! An apt description, I would imagine. <laughs> he chuckled softly. You, you knew about this! She squinted up at him. He innocently smoothed his green spines back. I suspected it. It wouldn't be the first occasion that I've witnessed time perform a perfect circle before my eyes, so it's hardly of any surprise to me. If anything, it should be something of consolation for the two of us. He pointed with a clawed finger. Does it say anything about the fate of that certain Pegasus, hmm? Scootaloo glanced once more at the document, her scarlet eyes narrowing. She murmured aloud, Cheerily and several students were interviewed to compile a list of details to describe the suspect but no matches were found in the immediate search. Within two weeks, Sheriff Goldmain decided the case did not warrant wanted posters. She made a face. The heck? I thought I'd traumatize those kids. Do not be so quick to demonize yourself, child, Spike said. If I recall correctly, Cheerley's schoolhouse was no stranger to bizarre incidents. In one winter month alone, the windows had to be replaced on three separate occasions from a single wayward postal worker flying far too low for Pegasus standards. You must realize, what made life in Ponyville exciting is far different than what makes existence in the waste exciting. He smiled slyly. Do, uh... She gulped, sliding the scroll back towards him. Do you have any more written evidence of my time-traveling self in your library, Spike? He took the scroll, shaking his scaled snout with a dangle of his violent pendant. Nothing that I've found, child. But, if you ask me, that can only be a marvelous thing. Why's that? Because it means you'll be following my advice. He grinned toothily, shelving the scroll away and closing the cabinet drawers. 
and the next time you go to the past, you will try to do things more subtly. She blinked, eyes wide. Y you're sending me back? Right now? Right after I just made a meal of myself? Oh, I could very well send you soon, Spike nodded. But it won't be so soon in the past. He marched over towards another cabinet and picked up a lead metal box with his clawed hands. For the sake of caution, I plan to send you a month after your, mm, cheerily incident. So it'll be four months before the cataclysm, Scootily remarked, her eyes narrowed knowingly at the purple dragon. You planned this from the beginning, didn't you? Miss Cheerily was a test. Hmm, indeed. He nodded, shuffling over on iron haunches with a box in his grasp. He placed it down under the lab table just above Scootaloo. And where you'll be going next, you'll be facing another test. A test of your tenacity for blending in with the world. A test of your ability to adopt a face and name, and even a backstory. Because where you'll be going, your strength in finding truth will inevitably go through a crucible of bending it. Something tells me you're not stressing where you'll be sending me as much as who you'll be sending me to, she muttered, standing up alongside him and glancing briefly at the box. Is this someone else's ashes? No, Scootaloo. I do not have the ashes for whom we both seek. Y you don't? Scootaloo blinked. H how come? Though I may be a master of time travel, he said as he undid the lock to the lead box and opened it with a rusted creak. I am anything but the Wasteland's chief scavenger. He reached into the box and pulled out several necklaces tied to a tiny white shards of Cassium. If you are truly committed to this experiment, Scootaloo, and if you are willing to go the links required to avoid an incident like what happened with Miss Cheerily from henceforth, then it will be up to you to find the last ingredient. How come everything is a test with you? She smirked briefly up at him. The last pony then motioned her snout towards the shards dangling from the dragon's grasp. What are these? Baby dragon teeth, renowned for their sensitivity to enchantment. Who's dragon teeth? Scootaloo blinked, then rolled her scarlet eyes. Oh, let me guess. But of course. He smiled, then melted his expression into a neutral sigh as he uttered. I've stored them centuries ago for such a time as they would become of supreme use, and, alas... That moment has come. He danced the dangling teeth between his scaled fingers as they glistened in the purple mana lanterns lining the cavern. Most of them are attuned to specific souls, each being the soul of a pony who I knew in the past, and who I can anchor your soul self to. With these enchanted teeth, you can find the remains of our former friends among the wastes of Equestria. And once you do... I'll have to bring their ashes, Scootaloo gulped. The ashes, we need to perform the binding. She looked sadly up at the dragon. Spike, why didn't you warn me about Shirley's remains before you sent me back? His nostrils fumed somberly. I suspect it may have made you reticent to take the necessary first step. You can't protect me forever, Spike. A truth that I acknowledge wholeheartedly, he said with a nod, then handed her a single dragon's tooth on an orange string. That is why I believe you are completely and fully ready to perform this search, as it will prepare you for the next chronal leap at hoof. She hung the orange-tinted tooth before her eyes, squinting at it. How do you know it'll work with me? The tooth, that is. The same way I'm able to send you into the past beyond the cataclysm where I myself cannot go, he said with a faint knowing smirk. The soul essence of ponies is the heart of the enchantment. A dragon tooth will be able to take you straight to the target's remains, while it will be completely dull to me, even if the fang itself came from my whelpish body. She stared intently at the tooth, sweating. I, I'm not sensing a thing, Spike. Shh, he exhaled calmly. Relax, child. Do not stress. Only feel. She took a deep breath. She held the dangling tooth close to her heart and closed her eyes. Through solid inhales, she tried to form a picture in her mind. What she got instead was a scent, a fragrance of dry barn hay, of rich soil and dirt, of rusted plows and wooden yokes, and rows upon rows of delicious red fruit. And then the panorama of luscious green trees flickered through her shut eyelids, 
and when she snapped her scarlet optics open, they were dilating under the persistent weight of truth. Applejack.